aims are to practice what happens after the two minute warning bell in the clinical exam. So to practice presenting differentials and management. Today's session is going to be on cardiology cases and led by Dr. Hannah Belsham Revel, who I think has just joined, um, yeah. which is lovely. Perfect. Um, if you're going to do the exam in June, Please, could you turn on your camera? I know it's scary, um, but I think it will make the session much better. And that way, Dr. Belsham Revel will know who needs to practice most. So if your camera's on, um, that's the way that she will know. So please join us. Um, and if you could fill out the pre-session uh, form in the chat, um, that would be great. So thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Dr. Belsham Revel now. Hello. Um, so. I, I we haven't really been given much information about about this so I was just running uh, planning on doing the session that I would normally do in the teaching which effectively is just to try and take some of your questions um, that you have about the exam um, and the things that you might be asked and then to go through some of those and, and I, I think it's it's incredibly difficult to do cardiology with this style of exam because the whole point of the cardiac exam station is to elicit the signs so if you're not being asked to elicit the signs I'm not quite sure what they're going to ask you because if they tell you what the murmur is and what the scars are then you've kind of gone halfway there already so that so I think it's it's really you know we've been asked to teach on the formal courses about this but I think we're all a little bit unclear as to how this kind of works um because it's it's clearly very very different to normal um so I just want to, was happy to sort of take questions from people and this is what we did in the session last time about any particular questions that people have got about things that might come up or that might help answer some of those questions because we've got no examples of what's what the questions are going to be so we don't know what you're going to be presented with um, from a cardiac point of view so if someone I you know it in the normal situation you're very rarely going to have a child who has an exact textbook description of a VSD or aortic stenosis so I don't know whether they're just going to give you a textbook description of something or something different so uh, Rashmi you've got your hand up um yeah I was gonna say you did a session for um the Evelina Wednesday morning session a few weeks ago and I think that would be um the perfect like style of teaching so basically um from speaking to trainees um who are going to sit the exam if we're presented with you know for example um a grade three murmur at the left sternal edge and this scar um talk about the differentials um that sort of thing that would be really helpful because i you know i have it's a new exam but i sus i suspect that would be a good way to practice i don't know yeah, I can go through. I mean, the, the problem with the ones that I did in the teaching are not thing, are things that I think you're probably unlikely to get in the exams because that was about neonatal collapse and patients presenting acutely. Um, and I, I think that's part of the problem is I, I'm not sure whether they are going to introduce that kind of concept and give you a patient with absent femoral pulses because you would never actually get one of those in a real membership exam because obviously they wouldn't be coming into <laughs> coming into clinic um or you know whether they're going to go the whole hog and give you neonatal collapse or whether they're going to give you uh you know murmurs and scars and then ask you to sort of make something up from the murmurs and scars and um, so me you've got your hand up Oh yeah, sorry. So just on that, so I think um, on the petal session, they did say they can include acute cases. So I think okay. someone did have a, have like an acute asthma case. So I think because it's all virtual, they um, are going to you're right. Yeah, so I think to, to just to me, it would have been your child with a atresia who is well examined as child. But I think you can. We can now get acute cases. Some people didn't get any, but there were a few people who did have an acute case, such as asthma. OK, well, what I can do is I can pull up the teaching slides that I did. Um, let me just go to the right one. Um, the teaching slides that I did, which had those cases in, um, which is predominantly um, I'll skip through the first slides because it's it's a bit general to start with and then get onto the cardiac bit and a few of the cases that we've seen. Um, I'll just get it up and then I'll share screen. Um, and I've also got a short presentation I did on murmurs for the nurses, which might 
might be useful as well. So I, I'll try and sort of put some bits and pieces together. Um, here we go. So. OK, I'm going to try and share my screen if I can juggle all the windows. <laughs> OK, can you see my PowerPoint? Not yet, we can see. Oh, mine's being a bit slow. Yeah. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. I can see that. Okay. OK, let me just get rid of it because you can see the answers. Otherwise, I have to make that small. OK, so um, the, the first little bit I just did was about timing of presentation of cases. So um, there's different times that cases can present. So uh, immediately after birth, and um, this is usually related to atrial obstruction, so obstructed pulmonary venous return, such as obstructed TAPVD or hyperplast with an intact or highly restrictive atrial septum. Uh, those with obstructed mixing, such as transposition with an intact or highly restrictive atrial septum or complex physiology or the myocarditis cardiomyopathy arrhythmia group, which obviously can present at any age and then PPHN. So I would hope that you probably wouldn't get any kind of like fresh neonates in the exam, but I guess they might throw in something like that. Um, then there's the patients that present usually age uh, days two to seven, and this is usually related to ductal closure. So it could be patients with a duct dependent systemic circulation, so hyperplastic left heart coarctation or critical aortic stenosis, or those with a duct dependent pulmonary circulation, such as tricuspid atresia, pulmonary atresia, critical pulmonary stenosis, severe tetralogy, or again, complex physiology, myocarditis, cardiomyopathies and arrhythmias. And then you've got your patients that present within the first month of life. And this is the majority of atrial or duct dependent lesions with delayed closure that aren't presenting earlier on or that are not genuinely totally dependent. This also includes conditions where, which worsen as the pulmonary blood flow increases, such as TAPVD, or potentially some children with very large shunts, such as a very large duct, an AVSD, or a very large VSD, and then your myocarditis, cardiomyopathies, and arrhythmias. And then the four to six week of age presentation is usually those as the pulmonary vascular resistance falls and the pulmonary blood flow increases. So again, shunt lesions, TAPVD, those with milder coarctation, aortic stenosis, tetralogy, and again, your myocarditis, cardiomyopathies, and arrhythmias. So these are just a series of cases. So these are all uh, infants or, or neonates who are presenting. Um, and I, I guess probably the easiest, because it's going to be difficult for me to juggle this and all the hands up, so people can just maybe shout out what they what they think the answer is, because I think that's realistically going to be the easiest way of doing it. Um, so a 10 day old baby, three days history of poor feeding, tachypnea with recession, a mild oxygen requirement. He's admitted given head box oxygen, nasogastric feeds because this is the middle of the winter, so bronchiolitis since, uh, season. But after two days, he had absent femoral pulses, which were felt, and there was a blood pressure differential with an upper limb blood pressure being higher than the lower limb. So what, what could the diagnosis be here? So co-optation would be one yeah. of your top differentials. And I think you're, you've got your absent femorals and you've got a blood pressure differential. So I think, you know, this is realistically co-optation until, until you've proved proved otherwise really and the key learning point from this one was about making sure you examine the femoral pulses of babies on admission not just two days into admission um, and this was a baby so this is one that is one that you won't necessarily get the diagnosis but you can probably look at a few sort of red flags so a five week old that's tachypneic with poor feeding and failure to thrive seen by the GP a few times and then seen in A&E. He's got a loud murmur and thrill, which is sort of around the mid-sternal area. Um, and it's an ejection systolic murmur. Um, and his SATs are 86%. The diagnosis in A&E was VSD to be seen in clinic and sent home on two hourly feeds. So I think my first question is, why isn't this a VSD? And the second question is, Given that information, what kind of things are going through your head about potential diagnoses? So ejection systolic murmur, failure to thrive and SATs of 86 um, percent. It's quite so he doesn't have restricted pulmonary flow, so it's less likely to have low SATs. Yeah. Um, 
And for it to be a loud murmur from VSD, that would be quite a small lesion. So it's unlikely to cause this kind of picture of a heart failure. It's also quite uh, quite quick to have heart failure from a VSD um, because your pulmonary pressures would only just be dropping. Uh, I think you, you've got all the key points there. A loud murmur is usually seen with a smaller VSD. Um, usually they present around sort of four to six weeks of age with beginning to get breathlessness. So if you've got a baby who's already cachectic at five weeks, this is something that's been going on longer than the last couple of weeks, which means, you know, a VSD is probably less likely. Um, and you're right, the SATs are 86%. So the baby's not got too much pulmonary blood flow by the sounds of it because the SATs are 86%. So the, those, those things all don't uh, add up. And also, I've said the murmurs an ejection systolic murmur. So what, what are the causes of ejection systolic murmurs? So it's 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 yeah. oh. Sorry? Aortic oh, stenosis? Oh. Pulmonary stenosis? Yeah, so essentially e ejection systolic murmurs are murmurs that occur, occur during ejection. So these are things like pulmonary stenosis, aortic stenosis. Um, so that's really your your other thing. Pan-systolic murmurs is where the shunt of blood is occurring the whole way through uh, systole. And I'll come on to my murmur talk just to go through a little bit about some of those differences. But I think, as you can see, this picture is, is, is quite complex um, because it doesn't really fit anything. And, and this baby actually had truncus, and that's not something you could get from the clinical examination. So I don't, you, you know, you don't need to be able to get that. But what you do need to be able to say is, hang on, this this doesn't fit with a VSD. You know, this this baby's desaturated. They've got a murmur. They're failing to thrive. You know, there is a cardiac problem, but I don't think you can necessarily pin it down based on that examination. Um, and certainly we didn't. It was an echo diagnosis. We knew there was a cardiac problem, but we didn't know what it was until we scanned the baby. Um, so this one's a one hour old neonate, poor condition at birth, meconium aspiration, unable to oxygenate despite nitric oxide and oscillation, and the baby's transferred for ECMO. So we actually have had two babies that were referred uh, with two different cardiac diagnoses. Um, and um, what kind of things would be going through your head here? Pulmonary hypertension. So the common things are common, PPHN, and you've got meconium aspiration. So, you know, those are your, uh, you know, those are your your features. So common things are common. That would probably be your number one. And even for a cardiology station, that's probably still your number one diagnosis for this picture. And what about chi cardiac diagnoses? So why, why can you be blue? What are the reasons that you can be blue? And duct dependent lesions? TGA. So a duct dependent, so for example, what, what, what duct dependent lesions may present with immediate cyanosis? Bearing in mind everybody's born with a duct. Hyperplastic left heart? No, hyperplastic left heart children are very rarely cyanosed. Interestingly, they are often quite, often quite well saturated. And bearing in mind, if you're born with a PDA, then the, so the majority of babies that are cyanosed immediately from birth, it's not necessarily a duct dependent lesion because you've usually still got your duct. TGA? TGA? Pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, we've, we've said pulmonary hypertension and PPHN, um, but someone said TGA. So TGA, so if we go back to those earlier slides, those presenting immediately after birth, it's usually related to obstruction to the atrial septum. Um, and, and there we go. So we've already got some of the, the effectively the list of diagnoses there. So TGA with an intact or highly restrictive atrial septum um, or a TAPVD or HLHS with an intact or highly restrictive atrial septum. So that's effectively like that presents like a TAPVD. So the majority of duct dependent lesions will TAPVD. Yeah. And, you know, these, it, I guess that's something they could give you. They could give you an x-ray and a clinical picture of a very blue baby. But, you know, you've got, you can see how that's mistaken for sort of, you know, meconium aspiration because you've got a really quite horrible looking chest x-ray. So this, this baby in particular had TAPVD, 
we had another one that presented a little bit older who did have critical pulmonary stenosis so the baby's got had shut but that baby presented a, a day or two of age rather than that but effectively you can be blue because you have inadequate mixing you have inadequate pulmonary blood flow or you have a left heart and the baby's commenced on prostin and transferred now this one is a little bit of a trick question but there are two two important differentials and i'll tell you which one this baby actually had so what does the clinical examination so forget what the echo showed but what does the clinical examination suggest sepsis Yep, so and again, I think you set, most of our cardiac patients pr effectively present with sepsis and get antibiotics and then you will have a coexistent cardiac diagnosis. So I've got one with complex cytosine versus AVSD who actually presented collapsed at seven days of age from GBS sepsis, nothing to do with the heart. The heart was a sort of incidental finding. So it is you've got a patient who's got poor poor feeding, reduced pulses, this baby could well be septic. It just happened that this baby got an echo at somewhere along the line and so ended up down the cardiac management stream. So thinking of cardiac, what would be your two cardiac differentials based on the examination? And then you can take into consideration the echo. Coarctation. So it's unlikely to be coarctation because all the pulses are weak. If you've got severely impaired function, then it could be that you've got low output all over. But if all the pulses are weak, where does that suggest that the obstruction is occurring? Hypoplastic. Hypoplastic left heart. Stenosis. So, yeah, critical aortic stenosis or hypoplastic left heart would give you all pulses being weak. And this would be with a, a closing duct. Um, however, interestingly, this baby had a slightly different diagnosis, and this is one of the pitfalls of um, doing an echo, is this baby actually had TAPVD. And the reasons baby with, babies with TAPVD look like they've got a small left heart is because all the blood is going back to the right side of the heart. So the right side gets very enlarged, uh, and actually the baby's left heart was absolutely fine when it actually had some blood after he'd had a, a TAPVD repair. But the, you know, the main differential here would be some critical outflow tract obstruction on the left side of the heart. So this one's another one, then these are all real examples. And this is a five-day-old baby who's actually relatively well, a little bit of reduced feeding. The parents have noticed poor colour since birth and reassured, but were seen at the GP surgery for a prolonged jaw disc screen and the SATs were measured at 34%. And so the baby was taken straight to A&E. So again, we've talked about what are the different reasons that babies can be blue. And usually TAPVD if your SATs are 34 you're pretty sick and you're on a ventilator so we're looking at something where maybe the baby's got enough blood going around their body but probably just the wrong colour blood so what's your number one differential here in the absence of a murmur polycythemia no, this, go for just for cardiac ones for these ones now, because my general paediatrics is too long ago for some of the other stuff. So, so ca um, cardiac causes. So a blue baby who's relatively well. So no murmur, oh. maybe TGA. Yeah. So a blue baby with no murmur is probably TGA. Um, if they've got a murmur, then they could be a tetralogy or a critical pulmonary stenosis. But the TGAs can sometimes be very, very blue and relatively well because they've got the right, right amount of blood going around their body. It's just the wrong colour. Uh, and this baby did have TGA and they sat on PICU breastfeeding overnight and then got an arterial switch the following day. So this one is a, a three week old baby who's been well since birth. A recent upper respiratory tract infection and is presented with three days of inconsolable crying, pale, sweaty. The ECG's heart rate's 140 per minute with relatively flat ST segments. So what's going through your head here as potential differential? M myocarditis? Yeah. And I think the, the bits to put together there is a, a baby that's generally been quite well. So it's something that hasn't presented earlier on. They've had a recent respiratory viral infection. That's not always present, but often there's some sort of vague viral history. Um, and they've had a relatively short history of heart failure type 
sounding symptoms with crying, pale, sweaty. Um, and that, they, that can also go for sort of baby angina as well, that type of picture. And also these sort of flat ST segments, and you tend to get this sort of general or overall low amplitude ECG with flattish ST segments or ST changes, which you can see in myocarditis. But actually any baby presenting with a, a heart failure type picture, whether it's a dilated cardiomyopathy or another cause, may present in a similar way. Um, and then it's another uh, three week old baby. This one's been well since birth, but the last few days has had reduced feeding. The baby's asleep in the department, having just had a feed and has a resting heart rate of 180 per minute. And again, we'll assume that you screen for sepsis and you know, other, other causes of a sinus tachycardia like that. But what card cardiac causes could you be thinking about now? These are not trick questions. This one's not a trick question. SVT? Yeah, some kind of SVT or atrial tachy or some tachyarrhythmia. And this baby could be presenting with a tachycardiomyopathy. So their heart rate's been so fast. And obviously, small babies can tolerate high heart rates for some time. But actually, it then gets to a stage where they start developing heart failure. So this baby may well have been batting along at 180 since birth, has tolerated that very well. And then finally, it started to get the better of the muscle. So this, uh, these slides are just briefly looking at blood pressure and oximetry. So obviously, normally you would expect uh, normal upper limb and lower limb saturations and blood pressures to be all similar. So if a patient has all of those, it doesn't necessarily give you any particular pointers. A coarctation or interruption of the arch who has their duct open may give you lower sats in the feet, but relatively similar blood pressures because the duct is open. Um, if the baby is a very well baby, the sats in the feet may well be 100% because they may well be adequately oxygenated. Um, the baby may, if the baby has PPHN, you can also get right to left shunting across the duct, even in the absence of coarctation. So this could just be PPHN, but this is the kind of picture that you may see. Then as the duct begins to close, the saturations in the feet will start to rise, but the blood pressures will start to fall until eventually the duct shuts and you have lower blood pressures in your legs and normal saturations in all four limbs. And one of the things that's important to note is that we tend to look at right arm and leg blood pressure because the right arm is usually preductal, as that's usually the one that comes off the head and neck vessels first. Uh, the left uh, subclavian can be periductal, so it's not always that reliable. So we tend to say get a right arm and a leg. There is no good reason from a cardiac point of view why the leg ones would be different. Um, the main reason to get both leg ones done is just to corroborate your, your picture. The other important pattern to note is what's called the reverse differential. And this is where the saturations are lower in the right arm than they are in the rest of the body. And this is transposition with a PDA. And that is because the right arm is what comes out the heart first. And because the blue blood is coming out the aorta, the sats are lower and then you get mixing across the duct and the saturations after that are higher. So this reverse differential is very important to know. So in the absence of an aberrant right subclavian, the right arm is what the brain is getting and is the first thing to come out of the heart. The left arm is often periductal, so it's not always that useful, but legs are always postductal, so it can give you the idea of the PDA shunt. Um, chest x-rays, all the usual other bits, you might see some abnormality. So I guess they could give you a, a patient with allergies. So show you a chest x-ray with hemivertebrae and then say there's an ejection systolic murmur that radiates to the back, representing the branch PS that you see in allergies. So I guess it's worth remembering some of these associations. Um, where is the heart? Is it left, right? Is it in the midline? Does it look big or small? Are the lung fields plethoric or oligemic? And can you see any missing shadows or big things? Uh, and one of these things which is quite useful is if you have pulmonary plethora with a large heart, you probably have increased pulmonary blood flow. So you you might have a VSD, you might have an AVSD, you might have a duct. However, if you have a small heart with congested lung fields, then this suggests there is pulmonary venous congestion. And this is more likely to be your sort of TAPVD type pictures. 
There's a lot of stuff in the textbooks about tetralogy and boot-shaped hearts and TGAs and narrow pedicle and all of that, but the, the x-rays very seldom ever look like that. So I don't think that is always necessarily helpful. So I don't tend to kind of teach on that because I've never been massively convinced. Scimitar, I think, does look like a scimitar, but often in retrospect, like when you go back and look at the chest x-ray. Um, so those were some slides on some of the presentations. I was also go, uh, going to open up uh, the one I've got on murmurs. And then we can just talk through the murmurs as well. I think I might have to rescreen share again. Let me just try doing that. <gasps> okay. Right, can people see the slides now? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So this was something I just did. It's just a few slides um, that we I was asked to do for like a nursing course on examination. Um, so this was predominantly about the the sort of precordial examination. So first thing is where is the apex beat? Is it left, right, or is it in the midline? Is it displaced? Is it forceful? Is there a heave? So placing the hand on the chest, do you feel your hand moving? Not, not just like in skinny kids where you see the cardiac activity, but is the whole sort of chest wall moving as your hand is moving? And is there a thrill, which is often found as it felt as a buzz or vibration of your fingers? And if present, where is it? Because that will probably tell you where the murmur is loudest. In terms of auscultation, again, the usual rules, diaphragm in all areas, bell for lower pitch sounds, although in paediatrics, you just use what you've got. Um, once you've identified where the apex is, you know where to listen. And if unsure, make sure you listen on the left and the right. Um, don't use areas such as aortic area, pulmonary area, tricuspid area, mitral area, as in the majority of children with congenital heart disease or dilated hearts. This will not necessarily correlate, but use anatomical landmarks. So the murmur is loudest at the upper sternal edge, the lower right sternal edge. Um, this intercostal space, that intercostal space on the left, on the right. And that way you can be absolutely clear about where it's occurring. Because if you say to an examiner that it, it's loudest in the aortic area, you're making an assumption that everybody knows where the aortic area is and that the aortic valve is behind that area where you're listening. And then, of course, listen for radiation to the neck, the back or the axilla. So this is uh, just a chart showing your murmurs. So these are the events in the cardiac cycle. So initially you've got mitral tricuspid closure, which is usually about the same time. And then S2, you have aortic valve and pulmonary valve closure and the spacing should vary with respiration. And if you have a fixed split of the second heart sound, do you know what congenital defect that is associated with? ASD. ASD. Yeah. Uh, but Often the child's heart rate is too fast to actually properly appreciate that. But if you have an older child with an ASD, if, if you ever sort of have one on the ward or see one, do you have a listen? Because I think you can actually hear it. Um, systole occurs where there's a pulse. So if you hear a murmur where you can feel the pulse hitting your finger, then that's systolic. If it's not, then it's diastolic. Pan-systolic occurs all the way through or usually all the way through to the second heart sound and is a similar um, volume the whole way through. So it's ch -ch -ch -ch, as opposed to an ejection systolic murmur, which is a crescendo decrescendo murmur. So it's ch -ch -ch. so it gets louder and then it falls away again. And if you can imagine if you've got a VSD, you've got blood going the whole way through systole causing the murmur. Whereas if you've got a narrowed valve, the peak of the murmur was, will be as it is ejected through that valve and then it will fall away. A continuous murmur is heard all the way through, and this is usually something like a duct or a shunt, and that's a sort of shh, 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 shh. So you can hear it all the time, but it may be louder in systole. Diastolic murmurs are very difficult to hear. I'm not sure I've ever heard a mid-diastolic murmur. 
the early ones are often the, the regurgitations, the aortic or pulmonary regurgitation. And what you can hear sometimes in a patient that's got a bit of stenosis and regurgitation is it sounds a little bit like the C. So you have a sort of ch, 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 ch but it comes away. So that's different from your continuous type murmur where you can hear it throughout. In terms of grading, um, this is the, the formal grading, one out of six being very faint, two out of six is quiet, but you can hear it with a stethoscope. Three is basically what we call everything, so the sort of one in the middle. Four is with a thrill. Five is where the stethoscope is, doesn't have to be touching the chest to hear it, and six can be heard with a stethoscope off the chest. Diastolic murmurs are graded one to four out of four, and I think it's probably a bit of fiction how people nowadays grade those, as I think there's no good clinicians that can only auscultate left or because we all use echo machines. So in terms of position, think about what you are hearing. You are hearing where the blood hits or accelerates or leaks to. So in the normal heart, this may help you decide what valve is affected, but in the abnormal heart, this obviously does not necessarily help. Radio radiation will also help. So aortic murmurs radiate to the carotids because the blood shoots out of the heart and goes straight up into the head. And that's why you hear it in the carotids. Pulmonary stenosis murmurs radiate to the back as the pulmonary artery is directed backwards and therefore the blood flow goes backwards and you hear it loudest at the back. And if you think where a VSD is, VSD is between the lower chambers of the heart, so it's likely to occur to be loudest lower down on the chest rather than higher up on the chest. So some classic murmurs, pansystolic murmurs, VSD, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, these both have flow through systole. A small VSD occasionally may be shorter as flow will stop before the end of systole as the muscular contraction closes the VSD off. Ejection systolic murmurs such as pulmonary stenosis, aortic stenosis, cohortation of the aorta, branch pulmonary artery stenosis, or even a flow murmur um, occur as ejection systolic as the blood is being ejected. So the murmur starts quieter, then gets louder and then falls away again. Diastolic murmurs would almost certainly be in for examination purposes, pulmonary or aortic regurgitation, as mitral stenosis is very rare these days, particularly in paediatrics. Continuous murmurs, duct being the most common, collaterals can be heard as continuous murmur, shunts, uh, such as like as in a modified BT shunt, and coronary fistula, and this is because flow occurs throughout both phases of the cardiac cycle. Um, then you need to make note of any added sounds. Can you hear any ejection clicks, tumour plops, gallops, um, or the prolapse sound, which is said to sound like a seagull. And actually, once you've heard a prolapse, mitral valve prolapse sound, you won't forget it because it is a sort of wee, 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 wee sound, even when there's very mild prolapse. So it's a very sort of odd sounding murmur. And the way that I tend to present these, which obviously is going to be different because you'll actually probably get someone presenting this to you, is I would say there is a two out of six ejection systolic murmur heard loudest at the upper left sternal edge and radiating or not radiating to the back and is not associated with a thrill or a heave. The second sound was normal and then you've described all of your kind of cardiac examination stuff there. Um, innocent murmurs is just the sound of blood moving around the body, the normal finding in childhood, they're increased in hyperdynamic states such as anemia, fever, exercise and pregnancy. They're never diastolic. They're usually one to two out of six, but some of them can be louder. They never are associated with heaves, thrills or radiation. They can be heard loudest in different places across the precordium. They may well be high pitched and buzzing. There's also no other stigmata of heart disease and they can change with position. In terms of red flags, any diastolic murmurs and abnormal second heart sound, any additional sounds, a suggestive history or other stigmata of heart disease, thrills or heaves or any radiation. So there's another few cases here. Now I'm going to have to try and remember what they are. So this is a two month old baby, normal antenatal scans, normal delivery, born on the 50th centile, now between the 9th and 25th, has some reflux, looks well, has palpable femorals, liver edge is palpable and has a three out of six pansystolic murmur at the lower left sternal edge with no radiation. So what's the uh, potential diagnosis here? PSD. Yeah. And I think, that, you know, this is, yeah, this is the kind of classical 
you know, VSD type presentation, a baby who's been well, starting to fall off the centiles, a little bit of a liver, three out of six pan systolic murmur at the lower left sternal edge. So that's your kind of probably typical VSD. And I think that, that's the kind of thing I think you could well get. Um, this is a, an eight year old girl, fit and well, a murmur heard while she was unwell, but persisted when she was afebrile. She's got no liver palp uh, palpable, femorals are palpable. She has a three out of six ejection systolic murmur, loudest at the upper left sternal edge with no radiation, and she has a heave. So I think it's probably, septal defect. Yeah, there's probably two I would put down for this. And I think ASD is probably your number one because this is a well child and you've got an ejection systolic murmur because you've got increased flow across the pulmonary valve and you've got a heave because you've got a dilated right heart. What else could it be? Pulmonary stenosis. Yeah, could be pulmonary stenosis. So you've got you've got your ejection systolic murmur at the upper left sternal edge. Um, and you could have a heave from right ventricular hypertrophy causing that. So I think that would be your, your differential in this situation. And the kids eight, so whatever it is, is something that they've survived till eight with. So it's not going to be major congenital heart disease. So four year old boy, murmur heard on pre-op assessment. He's got no liver palpable, um, palpable femorals and has a two out of six buzzing murmur at the upper left sternal edge with no radiation. So what would you be putting your money in? Innocent. innocent yeah and i think it's like you know it could be mild ps but it's probably going to be an innocent murmur you've got a well child it's got that buzzing quality so it's probably innocent um one at one year old murmur heard by the gp when having vaccinations well growing on the 95th centile no liver palpable femorals palpable four out of six pan systolic murmur lower left sternal edge with a thrill and what do we think this is VSD. Yeah, and what type of VSD? VSD. Or should small I say VSD. what size VSD? Yeah, you've got a kid that's on the 95th centile, so they're clearly doing well. You've got a thrill and you've got a loud murmur, so this is probably a pretty small VSD. Um, so again, just yeah, the volume, timing, area of largest intensity, radiation, and then associated features. So I think that's, I, they're the kind of cases which I would hope the kind of thing they give you rather than anything more complex than that, because I think anyone that can say they can tell what's wrong with someone with more complex signs is probably not telling the truth. Um, I guess a little bit about scars. Let me just finish. Um, finish screen sharing. Um, a little bit about scars. So the, the main ones that you will see in cardiology will be the median stenotomy down the front of the chest. Um, and that's the majority of operations that need to go on cardiopulmonary bypass. So it doesn't actually tell you anything other than they probably had a heart operation. Um, lateral thoracotomies, which can be on either side, and they can actually often be round by the scapula, so they can be very hard to see. Um, lateral thoracotomies could be done for a vascular ring, could be done for an arterial duct if it's an ex-prem baby, coarctation repair from the side, potentially BT shunt, although a lot of BT shunts are done from median stenotomy. So I know a lot of textbooks talk about a tetralogy with a scar here and a scar here, but that's all a bit of a fallacy because the majority of tetralogies have primary repairs straight off, and if they have a shunt they'll have it from a, a stenotomy. But they're the kind of things you could get from thoracotomy scars. So to remember, uh, there may be scars from pacemakers. So they could have scars at the top of their chest on either side because the generator could go either side. If you're feeling someone's abdomen and you feel something very hard that doesn't feel like liver, but it's in the abdomen, that could be a pacemaker or an ICD as well, as that's also where we put them. So if you feel something like that, and they put it in through the median stenotomy, so you won't necessarily have a scar on the abdomen to look at, then have a think about that as well. And then obviously a lot of children will have separate scars from drains, PD. Um, some of our patients might have laparotomy scars as well if they've had neck associated with their procedures um, or other, you know, other scars associated with that. Um, so I think if you're putting scars together with the heart sounds, 
it's is quite difficult because a lot of our children who've had surgery might have had reparative surgery but will still have a murmur but it doesn't necessarily mean they've got a residual lesion it's just more when you've had a heart operation the majority of people have some kind of murmur that that they're left with um and then maybe if people maybe for questions if people want to put their hands up it's difficult because there's 60 people dialed in that I'm, i don't know whether i'm going to see all the hands but maybe if people have got questions can put their hands up and then i can see if i can uh, see that somehow <laughs> Well, if you put your hand up and I don't notice it, then just shout your question out because. <laughs> um, Hannah, I think it will be quite useful to talk about like management as well. So like for heart failure and then like the different yep. steps, like medical management, then like when do we go on to surgery and things like yep. that. So if we if we do some of the um, start maybe with some of the, the, the basic congenital heart disease, so something like a VSD. So if you have a small restricted VSD, then that's managed conservatively and we would just follow in clinic and check there's no complications from it and that it closes. If you're talking about a child with a big VSD, um, the first institution would be medical therapy, which would be high calorie feeds, plus or minus nasogastric feeds. Um, diuretics, which we usually use fruzamide and spironolactone, but each place will you know, have a slightly different preference. Um, we may or may not use an ACE inhibitor, um, and then if the baby is still failing to thrive despite that and the VSD looks big, then we would probably move to surgical closure somewhere between three and six months of age. And we tend to do it early because we don't think it's fair to put the kid through a lot of heart failure if the VSD is going to need closing, and also to prevent the formerly vasculature. Um, arterial ducts, effectively very similar to a VSD if it's big then you are going to want to treat for heart failure. Um, if it's an ex-prem baby, then um, you know it's probably not going to close and you're probably going to think about a procedure. And this can be done in the cath lab, and that includes babies down to a, a, um, a kilo or less, um, or it could be done surgically. So there are two options for PDAs. Uh, AVSD, so another shunt lesion, um, we would usually aim to repair an, a big AVSD, again, by about three to six months of age, and again, heart failure medication in, in the interim. Um, things like aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis in isolation um, would usually be managed with a keyhole catheter procedure to balloon the valve. Um, if it was very severe and a small baby, then you might consider surgery, and at older ages, you might need to consider valve replacement, but catheter is probably your mainstay. Co-optation is another one. If Generally, if you present as a neonate, you get surgery. As an infant, you might get a cardiac catheter or surgery. And if you present as an older child or an adult, you will probably get a catheter with stent. And that's generally the sort of three age groups that people present the co-optation. Um, transposition is neonatal surgery. Uh, single ventricle conditions, neonatal palliative procedures, and it's important to know that for single ventricle, all our strategies are palliative surgery, if there's no curative surgery. Um, and we would normally do an initial procedure depending on their underlying anatomy, which might be a shunt, it might be a Norwood, it might be, you know, some sort of complex procedure, then they would go forward to a superior cava pulmonary connection when they're a few months old, when their SVC is connected to their pulmonary arteries. And then um, when they're school age, we would complete the Fontan circulation by joining the IVC to the branch pulmonary arteries. But I think that would be probably pushing it a lot to get you to describe the Fontan pathway. But I think knowing that the Fontan pathway is the final common pathway for complex single ventricle conditions is probably in, enough. Know what it is uh, and know that there are steps to get there. I think that's probably the main thing. Uh, tetralogy, as I said now, a lot of tetralogies will just have a primary repair when they're three to six months of age, but if they need more pulmonary blood flow earlier, they might get a shunt or they might get a catheter as well. Um, I, think they, I think they're most of the sort of uh, mm -hmm. common, common conditions. Um, so effectively, the younger you present, the more likely you are to get something done surgically as a baby. The older you are, the more likely you probably get a catheter. And ASDs are the other things. Um, so ASDs in very small babies don't normally need treating, and you normally can wait till they get bigger and then can have a catheter to do a catheter closure of the ASD. 
and some VSDs are catheter closed for as well, but that's very center specific. So, and can, it, can anyone else think of any other things I've made? Oh, TAPBD obviously is neonatal surgery. So. <laughs> and just in terms of like MDT involvement, like we normally have like dietitians. Like, is there anything else you would want to add to the MDT part of the cardiac um, management? So, so dietitian definitely. Um, obviously this is in an ideal world because realistically you hardly ever have access to the proper team but dietitian definitely um, we do a lot of work with speech and language therapists because a lot of our children are refluxy we have quite a high incidence of left vocal cord palsy after a lot of neonatal surgery particularly around the arch and the duct um, and so children may have unsafe swallows so speech and language are part of our, our team and actually increasingly um, sort of community pediatrics neurodevelopmental reviews as, as increasing numbers of our children undergoing neonatal surgery do you have some neurodevelopmental needs as they get older but for managing something like heart failure it would be the dietitian would be your your main person and and therefore very important to, to you know your whole things about I would measure the blood pressure I would plot on a growth chart the growth charts are really really helpful to decide whether someone needs surgery or not and in terms of investigations when you do that like run through at the end of what you would do um, always have echo quite low down because echo is a specialist investigation so actually your you would do your chest x-ray your bloods your gas you would get an ECG and then you would you know discuss with cardiology for consideration of an echocardiogram so don't kind of put it straight up there because actually what they what what the, the membership is testing you is when you're in your dgh what do you do to get your diagnosis because you are not going to necessarily have an echo like on hand but actually from your ecg from your chest x-ray can you get pointers towards what your diagnosis might be and in terms of ecg for structural heart disease um probably the p wave morphology is one of the useful ones because you have the p mitrali so your m shaped p wave in left atrial enlargement so that suggests that there's some problem causing left atrial enlargement or p pulmonali with a tall peaked p wave suggesting there might be some problem with right atrial enlargement so you might that might give you a clue and also if you've got a neonate uh, the, the, the axis could be helpful because if you have right axis deviation it's not helpful because neonates have right axis but if you have a neonate with left axis deviation that tells you there's a problem um, and superior axis is seen in AVSDs and what other conditions might you see superior axis in I think there's five but I only ever remember three it is the primum yeah, so ABSD or yeah, prime and ASD, but two other. So one is Noonan's, and I've got no idea. We don't know why Noonan's, but Noonan's children can have superior access. So if you've got a kid you think has got Noonan's, get an ECG because if they've got superior access, that might actually tell you that you've got your diagnosis right. Uh, and Ed Stein's as well which I think is just because everything's a bit screwy in Epstein's. But they're, they're the three that I always remember. So if you get superior axis, there's some, probably something wrong with the heart. Um, and if you've got left axis deviation, that either means that the left heart is big. So this could be a lot of left ventricular hypertrophy with aortic stenosis or something like that. Or um, it means that there is no right heart. So it could be something like a tricuspid atresia. So a big left... So left axis could be a big left heart or no right heart right axis deviation doesn't actually tell you a lot unless you're looking at an older child in which case if you've got right axis deviation that that's not normal because you shouldn't at that stage um so ecgs can give you little pointers um as to whether there could be a structural heart disease as well and if you've got your murmur and you've got your ecg and you've got your chest x-ray you might be able to start piecing these things together but i think realistically you know when we referred patients we get referred 
a clinical situation we we very rarely get anyone going and i think it's this so <laughs> even if a consultant brings us we go oh we've got a child with no femoral pulses they don't go we've got a child with coarctation they've got a child with no femoral pulses so i think people are sometimes a bit hesitant to sort of you know put put their money where something is but actually when they come through the door before we start the echo we've all sat there gone right okay what does everyone think it is so that you know we all have a, a little bit of a think about you know what we've been told and, and and what we think it might be um and sometimes we're right sometimes we're wrong <laughs> so. any other questions and the um that talk, the one about the, the neonatal collapse that I did, and um, that one um, is available, I think, on the foam ed. Uh, we did it as an e-learning thing on foam ed, so the little stick figure people with all the blood pressures. So if anyone wants to look at that, that's available on that. And then I think Imran, if you got your hand up. Uh, yeah, uh, there was a question. Uh, a child who has been operated before with a, a median sternotomy scar at two years of age. And now the child is seven years old. He's growing well, 50th centile, both height and weight. But now he suddenly developed a sharp pain in his chest that lasted for around a minute or so and then settled. So what could be the possible reasons for this pain? Examination only revealed a median sternotomy scar. Otherwise, he's well perfused and pink in room air with no respiratory distance, nothing. Um, so almost certainly it's musculoskeletal. So even in children with a history of congenital surgery, chest pain is vanishingly rarely caused by the heart. The, the caveats where you would like, you need to take a little more care are if, the, if they've had transposition of the great arteries because the coronaries have been manipulated, um, or if they had an anomalous coronary or a coronary fistula operated on. But the majority of chest pain in children, even in some of our most complex patients, will not be related to the heart. So in, in any child presenting with chest pain, really, it's the history. And I use, I, do, I don't know if you know the Socrates acronym. So sight, onset, character, radiation, associated features, timing, exacerbating or relieving features and score. And I use that for, for all my chest pain patients. And actually, you can usually elicit some kind of change with respiration or Pal tenderness on palpation or something that, that reassures you it's musculoskeletal. In our patients where there is something that worries us that it might not be musculoskeletal, so maybe they've had one of those operations in the past or there's something in the history like it's only with exercise or something like that, then we sometimes do CT scans, exercise tests, MRI perfusion studies, but the majority of patients it's nothing to do with the heart. Okay, okay thanks. Um, I've got another question, um, Hannah, just about um, antibiotic prophylaxis oh, for God. patients with. I know <laughs> it's in all the textbooks, but I know you guys don't do it. So, <laughs> so, so the history is that we all used to do it, and then Nice decided that you didn't need to do it anymore. But the cardiologist didn't really agree, and now everyone does their own thing. So um, the, the correct thing to say is you would discuss with the named cardiologist for the patient <laughs> and they would make a decision. So, it, I, so I, at Evelina, we follow the NICE guidance and the majority of patients don't get antibiotic prophylaxis. But as soon as they're 16, they all get antibiotics because the adult side at St. Thomas's do give antibiotics. So the correct thing is that I would check with the child's named cardiologist. If they've got valve prosthetic valves, um, they're very blue or they've had endocarditis before, then almost certainly they'll get it. But what you can say is, you know, I'm aware that there is nice guidance, but that there is variation from, you know, between centres. And so for FR, I've discussed with the cardiology. So you've shown that you know it's a thing, mm -hmm. but that there was also some variation in practice. Just trying to think of any other things like that that they might throw. <laughs> mm. Ex one thing I was asked in mine is I had a boy, 16 year old, aortic stenosis, and they asked me about exercise and exercise limiting. Um, and it was right at the end. So I think it was one of those kind of like supplementary questions where they just keep asking you stuff. 
uh, until the buzzer goes. Um, but generally speaking, the majority of our patients, we put no exercise limitation on and we let them do what they're able. And actually, it's far better for them to be fit and active than it is for you know them to just sit on a couch all day or whatever. Um, but if patients do have aortic stenosis or significant outflow tract obstruction, then we would limit their, you know, no strenuous exercise. And generally we say no, uh, no contact sports where someone could kick you in the chest. So like they can do kickboxing in terms of training, but just not fight. And they can play football and stuff like that because people don't, you know, shouldn't be kicking you in the chest in football. Um, rugby the jury's out a little bit some of my rugby playing colleagues say it's fine i i don't know rugby always seems so like violent to me <laughs> i'm a bit more scared um but essentially the majority of our patients we wouldn't advocate exercise restrictions that they would self-limit themselves and i think someone else has got their hand up but i'm not sure i can see who it is so the person that's got their hand up please feel free to say something um can i just think that this Sorry, go on. I think maybe there's more of us than one. Just about the anti uh, just about the impact, the chest impact thing. Is that um, to reduce the risk of arrhythmia or? It's. I think it's the the theory is because you've had a stenotomy and your aorta has been cannulated during bypass that there's a potential weakness to the aorta because they're also told not to do uh, flat weight lifting of more than twenty kilos, which obviously for most kids is not applicable so it's something more that gets you know they get told when they're older and i think it's to do with the aortic strength but i to be honest i'm not sure i've ever heard of anyone be hit in the chest and have a problem so i think it's one of these things that we tell people but whether it truly is real or not i'm not sure um i had a question uh, which i hope doesn't come up in the clinicals but i've heard parents ask this before um you know when you go to um theme parks and stuff well roller yeah. coasters um there are these signs that say don't get on if you ha have a cardiac condition or a heart yeah. condition um I, I don't know what that sign is like i, I don't know what condition that, that that sign applies to i think it's I think it's essentially a disclaimer to protect them from being sued. Um, it's uh, effectively the conditions that we would worry about would be probably people that had adrenaline induced arrhythmias. So if you're someone that when you're when you drink coffee, you get your heart arrhythmia or you get stressed, you get your heart arrhythmia, then, you know, you would probably be advising them against it because that almost certainly roller coaster is going to do that. The other group that we counsel against anti-gravity rides or ones where you go upside down are Fontans because their circulation will stop working when they go upside down. And I, to be honest, they all go on them and they're fine. But the theory is that because they, they, they're reliant, their pulmonary blood flow is passive. And so it's reliant on SVC and IBC flow passively to the lungs. So in theory, if you go on an anti-gravity ride, you might end up with no pulmonary blood flow, which would make you pass out. But I know some of our kids have been on them. But I think it's more a disclaimer to, you know, that if anything happens, the, the theme park would say, well, you shouldn't have gone on the ride. Um, but again, generally, we're not massively restrictive. I think the only restriction we do, like just thinking again, the endocarditis is the tattoos and piercings. Um, and that's, so anyone with, with a dodgy valve, a VSD, any kind of congenital heart disease which could get endocarditis, we say no to tattoos and piercings. Um, there's a little bit of flexibility with earlobe piercing, um, mainly because I think the rules were written by men, and I think they didn't, re you know, don't realise the pressure that you can be as a girl when you want your ears pierced. Um, but we definitely say no to tongue, nose, belly button, ear cartilage because they're all much more likely to get infected. But earlobe piercings are very, very low risk. But for the purposes of the exam, it's no to any tattoos or piercings, but I'm more flexible with earlobe piercings, um, particularly when you've got someone that's totally capable and gillet competent that can, you know, listen to the theoretical risk of endocarditis and make their decision. And then is it Supriya? Uh, yes, ma'am, I wanted to ask, uh, what are the exact criteria for VSD surgery? Is it just the age, or weight and other causes are also considered so we so in theory cardiopulmonary bypass is relatively routine above two and a half kilos 
So we, you know, we don't, there's no reason in theory that you couldn't do it at, at any size really that's above that. Um, but the tissues of the heart are much more mature in more mature babies. And usually by about three months of age, the tissues of the heart are more mature. So we prefer babies to be between three and six months of age when we do the surgery. Um, for some of the VSDs, you also want to give it time to see if it gets smaller. Um, but for example, if a patient has coarctation VSD, the surgeons will close the VSD in the coarctation operation as a neonate. So it, there's nothing stopping you do it but actually getting the baby a bit more robust and a bit stronger and having some time with the family is, you know, is, is good. The, there are no strict criteria and each institution will be a bit different, but effectively, if you proved you failed to thrive, um, you're in failure and you have a VSD that doesn't look like it's going to close, you've bought yourself an operation in my book. Great, so we'll just take one more question, if anyone's got one. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Belsham Revel. It's been really useful. Super helpful. Thank you um, so much. Could I just ask before everyone leaves, thank you so much for coming. Would you mind doing the feedback form? 